I'm a biological anthropologist, so I'm interested in how humans and non-human primates um, discern and acquire food resources and how the act of acquiring those food resources may have exerted a selective pressure on their anatomy in particular. Food is vital for life. Uh, you, if you don't eat, you don't survive, and so it stands to reason that uh, evolution or natural selection would uh, strongly favor the abilities, the behaviors, the, the morphologies or the anatomies uh, that allow organisms to acquire food efficiently. Uh, you have to have food first before you can think about other evolutionary uh, activities like reproduction. So food is first and foremost the most vital thing an organism does on a daily basis and um, the importance of getting it uh, is expected to affect its, um, its adaptations. And so when we look at ourselves, when we look at humans and we look at the unique traits that we have, a large brain, uh, the ability to walk on two feet, um, the ability to use tools, language, these things can be linked at least in part to the importance of acquiring food. At least that's what I think. Uh, we have a constellation of very unusual traits, and so something extraordinary happened in human evolution, and we need to link that to some, some uh, ability to acquire resources. So whatever those resources were, they were probably uh, not uh, tapped by other organisms. Humans evolved an ability to acquire um, a resource that other organisms didn't have an ability to acquire, and that took intelligence, and so I think humans uh, to explain the human career, you have to find something extraordinary, and I think um, food resources, particular food resources, may help explain that. Human beings were the most excellent animal long before um, agricultural products became an important part of the diet. So to understand how human beings became excellent animals, we have to look before, we have to look at the diet that existed before humans started um, growing plants for their own benefit or uh, harvesting and husband, uh, uh, maintaining animals for their own benefit. So um, yeah, I think um, it's safe to say that the, the factors that caused humans to be extraordinary um, cannot be linked to those domesticated foods. It has to be something that happened prior to the domestication of those foods. We know that humans had a mixed diet. Um, we can verify that in part by looking at modern humans that continue to hunt and gather foods, and we know that they have a very mixed diet. So things like honey are particularly important for people. Things like uh, starchy resources that come from underground are particularly important. For example, tubers and bulbs and corms, uh, these tissues that have a lot of starch and carbohydrates. Um, meat is important to an extent, but not as important as um, the popular media might lead you to believe. It's usually 25% or less of their diet, and it's very variable. It's unpredictable, it's hard to get. So um, humans tend to rely first and foremost on plant foods that they can find in the environment. Humans don't turn down uh, sugars from fruits, of course. The, if they find a fruit, they can eat it, but um, fruits are uh, not particularly reliable either. They're seasonal. Uh, the starches, the sugars that are um, kept in underground storage organs of plants are much more ubiquitous in the environment and much more reliable and are there pretty much year-round. Behaviorally, people are plastic and some people eat meat, but uh, anatomically I would say we're not adapted to meat at all. Our, our teeth are too big, our enamel's too thick, the cusp on our teeth are too short. So we simply don't have the adaptations that uh, you would need to chew meat efficiently. I mean, anyone can look at the teeth of their dog or cat and they can see what teeth should look like if you're going to eat meat. Our teeth don't match. So uh, you could say that we've evolved uh, a face and a mouth that's uh, for eating something else that's not meat and uh, most people believe that's plant foods. That's one of the great things about culture is that it releases us from some of these evolutionary constraints that most other organisms face. Um, so culture, for example, involves cooking and processing foods, adding spices, all sorts of other things that we do on a behavioral basis to widen the diversity of our diet and make ourselves um, far more eclectic uh, feeders than any other organism on the planet. Starch is a difficult thing to eat, actually. Um, the uh, starch granule is actually semi-crystalline, so it's extremely hard and extremely difficult to digest. And that's, that's for a reason. The plants don't really want you to be eating their storage reserves, so they protect it as much as possible. The way we humans and the way some other animals have overcome these defenses is by evolving a particular enzyme that allows us to hydrolyze, which is to say to break down that semi-crystalline structure. And uh, the enzyme that does it is called amylase. And we humans are blessed with uh, an abundance of amylase in our saliva. And you probably all have the experience of 
thinking about food and then your mouth starts to water. So saliva is a pretty important part of the feeding process. It allows you to, to digest foods very quickly in the mouth and you can convert the starch in the mouth directly to, to sugar with the amylase in your saliva. So one of the lines of research that we've been interested in pursuing is to try to understand the genes that are responsible for um, producing saliva, uh, amylase in the saliva in the mouth. And we find that humans vary in the number of copies they have of this particular gene. And that copy number matters. Those people that have more copies produce more amylase and so are better able to convert starch into sugars more quickly in the mouth. And we find that that ability varies globally so that populations that have historically eaten a lot of starch tend to have more copies of this particular gene. So this is one of the first uh, examples of a of diet exerting a pressure on uh, genetic variation and how copies of a gene can affect the way a protein is expressed in the body, which is to say the amount of protein that we see in a particular tissue. So, um, so humans are pretty extraordinary compared to other primates uh, for producing a lot of the salivary amylase, which we can attribute to uh, the importance of starch in, in the human diet. Uh, well, it means that we can rely on starchy foods to a greater extent. And um, in early human evolution, you can imagine that some of those starchy foods may have been relatively toxic. And so humans may have struggled to consume some of those starches. So by having uh, uh, genetic adaptations that allow you to process starch more efficiently, you can expand your overall range of edible foods and ultimately the more things you can eat, the more opportunities you have to uh, to grow a larger population, to, to resist uh, diseases more efficiently, to uh, tolerate environmental changes more effectively. So um, ultimately human success may be tied to its ability to eat a, a, a greater variety of food, option, uh, food options and uh, starch, the ability to digest starch is in intimately tied to that ability. As humans emerge and spread around the globe, um, they're going to be faced with a variety of different habitats and um, the foods that they may have been familiar with in one habitat may not be available, may, may not simply exist in a different habitat. So the one thing that all plants have in common is that they have starch. And so if you have the ability to digest starch, you can go anywhere. You can go into any habitat and find similar food resources that have that one uniting thing in common, that they're all based on starch. So if you can digest starch, you can live almost anywhere, except maybe the Arctic. All plants, uh, produce starch. So when a plant photosynthesizes, it's converting sunlight to starch basically, and that's what the leaves are there for. They're the starch creating organs of the plant. And then the plant sends that starch down through the bark down into the roots. That's ultimately where it needs to go. So uh, plants vary in the, amount, in the amount of starch that they have based on where they decide to store it. So some plants like to store that starch underground in the form of a big tuber, for example, or, or a bulb or a corm. But uh, all plants, all tissues and all plants have some starch. It's just some tissues have more than others. The seeds of a plant are another starch storage organ. And the purpose of storing starch in a seed is so that Presumably the seed gets deposited somewhere else. So the plant wants the seed to be dispersed away from itself and then it wants the germinating plant to use up those starch reserves to grow. Um, so we humans have uh, recognized that, that there's starch in these seeds and we can um, access the starch before, before it germinates. We know from the fossil record that humans consume animal foods. We know that for a fact. The importance of, the, of those kinds of foods for brain size development is a bit more ambiguous because what we see in the hominin fossil record is we see a gradual change in brain size throughout the lineage. And then we see a relatively uh, uh, large surge in brain size at about two million years ago with the, with the origin of our own genus, the genus Homo. So what we don't know is whether or not uh, increasing meat consumption uh, parallels those changes in a very, uh, in a very accurate way. Um, so because there is not a very strong match between meat consumption and increasing gradual increases in brain size, scientists have looked to other options. And given that plant foods are such an important part of modern humans that hunt and gather foods, um, the money is on plant foods and a shift in the kinds of plant foods as being the major driving factor in, in increasing brain size. I would say that a mix of plant foods with a large amount of starch coming from tubers and seeds. That's the, that's the fundamental 
component of the human diet.